Thank you for visiting Pastor Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWire.com. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to Pass the Wire TV. Uh, we have a, a, a fantastic guest on, on, on this episode of the show, uh, somebody who really needs no, no introduction when you have the kind of resume that they have in horse racing. Um, if you're watching this show, then you're probably more than familiar with who they are and, and, and what they've accomplished. But um, we welcome Graham, Graham Motion to Pass the Wire TV. And Graham, thank you so much for coming on the show. Not at all. Thanks for having me, John. You know, uh, a, a, a pleasure to talk to you. And, and, and th there's so much I, I, I'd like to pick your brain about because, when, when, you know, I'm, I'm a student of the game and a lover of the game. So when I get somebody like yourself and the opportunity to talk to, to, to them, I, I, I tend to go on in a million diff different areas because there's so much I want to know. Uh, but I, I, if I get off topic, you can just tell me, come on, John, shut up and, and, and move along. I won't take it personal, I promise. Well, we have that in common because we're both lovers of the game, so. Right, right. Um, before we will we'll, we'll start that, I will, I will share a little, a little kind of social media joke that I almost tweeted at you, but I didn't because I've never had the pleasure of meeting you. And when you, when, and you know, social media can be taken so wrong so many times. But it was something I thought at the time was funny, um, but I, I, I wasn't sure how you would take it. And sometimes people jump in and turn something that could be funny and okay between two people into a huge negative. But I, I've noticed that a lot of times people have a tendency to say, oh, Graham Motion, I wish he would stick to horse racing whenever you say anything at all about politics, you know? And I'm one of the people who like, you know, they say never discuss religion or politics. I can discuss anything with anybody, whether I agree or disagree, because I respect other people's opinions, you know? So I don't know, it was maybe a month or two ago, you ran a Philly back off a maiden win, either in a stake or a very tough allowance race, okay? And of course me, I always, always just have a, a tendency to bet against the maidens coming back against winners. And I left her out of either a pick five or a pick six or something like that. And sure enough, she won. And people were congratulating you. And I wanted to jump in on social media and say something like, oh, this grim motion, I wish he would stick to politics. But I figured you never know how <laughs> people are going to take it. So I figured out, I'll just leave it alone and say congratulations. But uh, I, I, I thought it was funny when it happened. And uh, I know you take a lot of heat over that, which I think is kind of silly. But... We, we, we live in a strange age, to, age today with, with, with social media. What I'd like to ask you first is, years back, you had really, really nice mare, but better, better talk now, Breeders' Cup winner, okay? And you ran a horse, I believe it was, um, or, or better talk now, what, what that, that was a gelding, I think, right? Not, not, not a mare, my mistake, right? <laughs> Right. Yep, um, that's right. My, my mistake. My memory is not what it used to be. But I remember you ran Shake, shake the Bank um, as what we would call a rabbit, which you very rarely see happen nowadays. Uh, why do you think racing has gotten away from the, quote, rabbit? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, the shake, with Shake the Bank and Better Talk Now, it was a constant source of frustration for the partners uh, Brent Johnson and, and Carl Barth and Chris Dwyer, it was a constant source of frustration that we, we didn't have pace frequently in these longer races. And Better Talk Now absolutely had to have pace. He, he wanted to be very keen. He could get a little rank. Ramon had an amazing way of getting him to switch off. But Brent one day came up with this idea of getting a, a, a pacemaker, and it, it really made a big difference. I think it actually won him you know, at least one grade one. So I don't know why it hasn't isn't done more over here. Certainly it's done more in Europe. Right. Um, I think Chad has done it at times with some of his better mares. So look, I mean, these longer races tend to be paceless races and I, I think it can be a bit of a game changer. So I, I can't answer your question, but if it's used in the right way, it can be a really helpful tool. Yeah, you know, you know and, and, and that's kind of why I find it odd that it's used so, so seldom today because 
you know, one of the complaints you hear, especially about New York grass racing, is that, you know, most of the riders like to take a hold and, 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 and there's often very little pace. Uh, and, and, and when you have a horse that likes to go, which you do have that we'll get to later, um, you, you know, it can, it can be a, a, an advantage. And a lot of times I, I notice races where I think, well, the best horse really didn't win, but the rider was just aggressive and took advantage of that, you, you know, lack of pace. So it's just interesting that it's not something that you see more of today. And I think you used it, you, you know, brilliantly. And 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 like you said, probably helped you get that 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 grade one win for that horse who would, you know, probably would have been at a disadvantage. Yeah, and Shake the Bank kind of became a barn favorite. I mean, he right. had his purpose. He actually almost stole one of those races. It might have he been did. the United Nations. And I thought at the top of the stretch, you know, they're going to have a hard time catching this horse. But it was more than just setting the pace. It was about spreading out the field. It was about making jockeys commit a little earlier than, you'd want, than, than they would want to normally. So, you know, when it's used properly, and I'm not saying we had all the answers, but when it's used right. properly, it's really useful and, and, and very tactful. I, I, I agree. Um, and an, an, another thing I, 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 I always wonder about, and I you know, don't really know the answer. You know, I can see both sides of, of, of the coin when it comes to training on a farm at like, like Fairhill, Fairhill where you do, or training on the racetrack. And, and, and one of the things I remember when I used to ride to Gulfstream, okay, and I would sometimes be caught in traffic before the first race, and I'd see horses being vanned from, I guess, Palm Meadows or, or Calder back at that time, um, and they would be stuck in the same traffic on Hallandale Beach Boulevard getting to the races as, as, as I was. And I used to look at those horses and say, you know, I kind of think they could be at a disadvantage. They're getting hot, they're getting bothered, they're in traffic, then they've got to get settled in at Gulfstream and run later on on the card. And I always thought that could be a disadvantage, but yet I see the advantage of training away from the racetrack and being on a farm in your own setting and, or, or, or a training facility in your own setting and really being able to do things your own way and, you, you, you know, pull the horses out and get them, you, you know, out of the stall as much as possible. Um, can you kind of pro and con that a, a, a little bit for the people out there that wonder if it's an advantage or disadvantage to be training at the racetrack or um, shipping in? And does shipping in hurt at all or, or, or cause any issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends a lot on the horse. Some horses handle it, you know, very smoothly. It's not a big deal to them, particularly when they get used to shipping. But, you know, there are horses and I have horses that don't really do well shipping on the day of the race. And you know, frequently those are horses that will try and run at Keeneland where we can just walk out of our stall and, and be in the paddock. So, you know, there's definitely something to that. I think horses are amazingly adaptable and most of them take to it. Right. Um, you know, when we run in New York on, on any given day, we have to leave here at 3.34 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, it, it's in the back of your mind if that can take something out of them. But by and large, the horses handle it very well, you know, especially if you've got a good arrangement with the, the shipping company, you know, that you know how they work things. Um, right. You know, you know they're going to go straight there. So it's, it's something that we, uh, we do a lot here at Fair Hill, obviously. Right. And, and being at Fair Hill, um, obviously you choose to be there. You could be, you, you could have stalls anywhere, any, a, anywhere you want. Um, being at a, at, a, at a training facility like that, do you find that advantageous to actual being, being, being on the backside at the racetrack? Yeah, I mean, there's just so many more things we can do with horses here. Um, you know, I, I can have a horse who might be a little difficult on the track that never has to see the racetrack. You know, I can take it out in the, in the fields or the paddocks and, and train it daily. Um, I can give a horse an easy week or two after they run when they, they might have had a hard race. They, they don't need to go to the track. So it just gives us a lot more options. Horses can, can be a lot more relaxed. Now, I have found the flip side of that. Every now and then you'll get a horse that gets a little too laid back being out here at Ferry. And I particularly remember a horse um, when I was at Jonathan Shepherds that never ran well off the farm. And Jonathan would always move him to Delaware or one of the tracks because he just, he needed to be a little bit more on the muscle to run well. And it was very obvious through his form lines that he didn't run well off the farm. So. It does work both ways, but by and large, it's just a, it's a better environment to train, you know, in a facility like Fairhill. 
Do you think your your success and and you, you know l- 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 let's be honest, you've reached the pinnacle of the game. You've you, you you've won the biggest races in the world between the Kentucky Derby, Breeders' Cups, the Dubai World Cup. Do you think it's your or at least in part your ability to you, you know rec- recognize the individuality of each horse? Uh, that leads to your success as opposed to having a, a system per se where horses just go through a system of training and the ones that thrive in that system thrive as opposed to really getting into the individuality of a horse, like you said, knowing who likes to be on the farm, who would rather be on the racetrack? I hope so. I mean, that's what I enjoy doing is, is trying to find, you know, a little bit of an angle of, a horse that might prefer not to do something on any given day or I, I I do get a kick out of that I think they are all different I remember when I was before I started training on my own I was working in France with John and Keith you know they don't have ponies in France and, and we had right. a horse at the races and and every time she'd run off going to the start and I said to the guy I said why don't I just walk her down to the start you know it wasn't it wasn't that clever a thing it was just seen right. to me and it made a big difference this filly who was always running a race before she got to the starting stall. So, you know, I do enjoy that side of it. Um, I, you know, I find myself more and more spending time at the barn rather than at the races, partly because we're always shipping, but I, I like being around the horses. That's actually what, that's what the pleasure is for me. And that's why I got in the game. Right, right. Um, you, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that you have some b- background in France, I believe UK as well, correct? A little um, bit, I grew up in, I didn't work much in training in the UK. I did work for a steeplechase trainer who was a friend of mine. I actually met my wife on the gallops in France. So that was it. Okay. Was... Interesting. Um, now, you, you know, they say the Kentucky Derby, the greatest two minutes in sports. And we, we, we know it's, you know, obviously the, the race that everybody wants to win in the United States. But, you know, you, you've won races, for example, the, the, the Dubai World Cup out of the United States. When you leave the United States and you win a race like the Dubai World Cup, can you kind of put in perspective what racing in America is on the world stage? I mean, everybody here thinks it's the most important racing in the world. And I, I, I over the past couple of years, watch a lot of racing from, from France and, 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 and Ireland and England, and, and I'm consumed by it i love it i i I think it's a fantastic product i love the way that they do things um i've become so much more familiar with it than i ever thought that i would and i look forward to those races as much as i do our big races and i don't think there's a lot of u.s racing fans that unfortunately feel that way but when when you go out of the u.s and you and 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 you, you you talk and interact with with trainers out of the country and owners out of the country i mean how did they look at U.S. racing on the world stage? Are we the quote, quote, leader um, and, and, and benchmark, or is it really not that way only in our minds over here? Look, I think racing in, in Europe and Australia and Japan, for example, I think it, it fits at a much higher level on, on the general sports platform. I think it's much more closely followed by the majority of, of the people in that country, perhaps than in America. But I think, you know, American horses are really well respected. And to me, you know, I love the Breeders' Cup. That's my favorite time of year. I love the international competition. I, I love that, you know, we're not going around trying to find the coziest spot to run in. We're taking on the world's best. And to me, that's what racing is all about. And I, I think there's nothing better than the Breeders' Cup, you know, I think what Wesley has done at Royal Ascot is extraordinary and what Mark Cassie did. I mean, I don't think people realize quite how difficult it is to accomplish what those guys have done. Taking them on at their own game in the UK. Um, right. So I think in this day and age, you know, where international travel is so much easier, apart from the last year, obviously, but, you know, the way we're right. able to move around, um, the way we're able to follow international racing on TVG or on, on our apps or or on social media, I think there's so much more interest. And to me, that's the most exciting thing. And I think the American horses are really well respected. Interesting. Um, I, 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 I agree. I think we get a lot of respect. And I think that, um, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that at times when we ship over to 
Royal Ascot or, or, or any of the races overseas, we can be at a little bit of a disadvantage because A, the ship in and of itself is, 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 is a far travel. And B, most of our horses are used to running on Lasix and then they have to ship and run without Lasix over there, which I think can be a disadvantage. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a factor for sure. But I think, you know, with, with less and less Lasix now in this country, I think that's gonna level the playing field somewhat. And look, I think it's very favorable for Europeans to come here where they have an opportunity to run on Lasix. So, you know, I think it plays both ways. I mean, to me, the most daunting part of Royal Ascot was when I first took Animal Kingdom over there and I walked the course for the mile and a quarter. I mean, over a mile of that course is uphill on softish ground. Right. That to me was a real challenge, way more than the Lasix or anything else. And and probably for that reason, I, I might have made a mistake by running him a mile instead of the mile and a quarter. But right. I just, of course, so intimidating. I was worried about how he was going to handle it. It's so different to anything that we do over here. Right. You know, an Animal Kingdom, uh, I... I, I mean, despite his laurels, and, and they're, they're, they're lofty for sure, um, I never thought that he got the respect as a truly great horse that he deserved based on what he did. I mean, he was a derby winner. Um, he ran well on every surface that, 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 that you put him on, be it synthetic, be it grass, be it, you know, dirt, obviously, the Kentucky Derby. And he never seemed to get that respect as, in, in my opinion, as an all-time great. Um, I, I, I think he's undersold a little, a, a, a little bit as, as far as that goes. What, what are your thoughts on that? Trying not to be biased because obviously you, you, you trained him. Yeah, I mean, the way I see it is possibly because the World Cup was run synthetic, not dirt. But right. to perhaps get the same respect. I mean, to me, I felt like the Kentucky Derby, I kind of fell into it. He was such a good horse. He handled the dirt. I didn't particularly think that was my training. Moreover, it was the horse's ability. I thought coming back in the, um, the Breeders' Cup when he was beaten by Wise Dan at San Trinita, I mean, you have to remember, he hadn't run since February. So not only was it kind of a crazy challenge to take on, to run him in the Breeders' Cup off for however many months layoff, Unfortunately, Barry was as crazy as I was and allowed me to go yeah. ahead with it. But, you know, he was unlucky in that race. I mean, if he doesn't right. get held up, like for an eighth of a mile, I think he gets pretty close to Wise Dan. So had he won that Breeders' Cup mile that year, that could have changed the turn the tables. But to me, the World Cup was just, that was so gratifying for me because it was a year of planning. You could almost make a case of saying it was two years of planning to get him there. And he right. got the to Dubai for those four or five days of just the, the best form he could have been in. And that was very gratifying to me. Yeah, no, that I, 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 I thought he was handled magnificently. And I think one of the things that has also changed in, in, in racing lately, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Wise Dan, is, you, you know, placing horses and spotting horses used to be looked at as more of of almost an art equal with, with, with training. And, and, and that seems to have almost gotten lost, uh, you, you know, now. Now everybody, and, and again, it, a lot of it comes down to social media. Everybody's an expert and knows who should run against who. And everybody wants every, every filly or mare to run against the Colts or run against the boys or, you know, run different distances. And I think, you know, spotting and, 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 and cleverly campaigning a horse with a specific race like the Dubai World Cup in mind has gotten lost uh, amongst a lot of fans and even a lot of trainers, you know, where they're just, you know, all out every race and don't have, you, you know, kind of plans and, 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 and ways of getting a horse to a certain race and getting them to peak at the right time. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I think, I think you're being a little harsh because I think there's some guys out there that do an outstanding job with this. You know, the guys that have the top horses that can point to those races, look, it's so much easier to, to move around now. So we have so many more options of where we can go and how easy it is to get there. So, but I mean, I think, you know, certainly from my point of view, I want to try and get my best horses to the Breeders' Cup in the best shape. And I, I, right. think, I think you kind of pay the consequences if you don't sort of point them for those races and you don't start thinking about it early in the year um, to get them there at their best. Right. So you, you, your, your, your style and your method 
is to kind of bring them along over the course of the year with that goal in mind and, 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 and kind of have them at their peak come, come end of October, early November for the Breeders' Cup. Look, I think so. I think if you're lucky enough to have horses of that caliber, I mean, I think it's very hard to be running in January and February at your best and expect them to still be peaking in November. At some point, they're probably going to have to have a break in the year if they're running all year. That, that's my own personal opinion. Now, uh, m moving on to a, a probably more, more difficult topic, and, and, and I'll start it with, with this. With, and I know Lasix has been beaten around all, all over the place, but one, one question I've always asked about Lasix that no one's ever been able to answer, and I've asked many trainers, many veterinarians, um, many people in the game, and no one's ever been able to give me as a layman an answer that I can digest. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I grew up around New York racing when Lasix was not permitted, okay? And we had full fields. We had horses that had a lot of longevity to their careers. We had rivalries. Um, we, we really had no issues at all um, as far as being related to Lasix or the lack of using Lasix. And Lasix came around and, you know, it went from a small percentage of horses running on Lasix to now I would say, what, maybe 95% of, of, of the horses here run on Lasix. So why was New York racing and we, w why were we able to be so successful and run so many horses without Lasix back then? And today, all the people that are pro Lasix say, well, you just can't do it. Now they all need it. They all bleed other jurisdictions that do it, they don't pay any attention to. What changed in, in, in racing from those days, which were not really that long ago until today, where you have so many people that say horses really need Lasix and they, they, they just can't run without it. What, what, what's changed? Look, I don't know if I can answer it better than anybody else, but I, I do think we've gotten into this year-round racing mentality where the horses tend not to get a break that perhaps they did 20, 30 years ago. But I also feel that, I personally think we're gonna find that we, we don't need Lasix as much as we think we do. I mean, I've been pleasantly surprised, and I'm not saying all my horses, but some of the ones that have not been able to run with Lasix in stakes races that have handled it just fine. You know, certainly when we scope horses, and I scope all my horses after, after they run, you're, you're gonna find, some degree of hemorrhaging it's just an, it just occurs with most race horses okay. but i do feel that we use lasix as a bit of a crutch i think most horses run better on it it helps them um and i and i think we've all grown so used to that but i, I would like to think that some people are going to find that we don't need it quite as badly as we did and look don't get me wrong there are going to be some horses that are not going to be able to run at the level they previously ran at, or not at all. And that's going to be the case. And, you know, that, that's tough for the owners because they invest an extraordinary amount of money in this game. My, my beef with the Lasix is I just feel like in our sport, in this day and age, I don't think we can have a, a veterinarian treating a horse on race day. I just don't think it's a good look. I think we need to be able to say that we're running clean, and, and every other country in the world does it. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be, it's going to take a while to get used to it. There's no doubt. I, I, I agree with you. Um, I'm all for um, no, no race day medication and as, 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 as little medication as, as, as possible. Uh, and I'm optimistic, cautiously, uh, that HISA, the Horse Racing Safety and Integrity Act, is going to begin to lead us down that road. Uh, is that your hope as well? Absolutely. I mean, you know, my, my frustration is people will see if they follow me on Twitter or, or whatever and social media is just the lack of leadership in our sport. You know, I think the whip situation in New Jersey, I think this would have been avoided if we had better leadership in our sport. This is because now everyone's taking this whip situation into their own hands and, and half of us don't even know what the rules are from one state to the other. It is so confusing. And New Jersey have taken a very strong stance on it. And, and I don't think it's necessarily the right one, but this has come because we have, we've had nobody, you know, somebody should have taken a stand a year or so ago so that we had a national standard in this country 
rather than letting every state decide what they wanted to do. And here we are, that's the situation. Did I lose you there? Yeah, you're back. Okay. It happens, technology. Uh, um, yeah, no, I, so, I, I agree. So I, my, my point with, with the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act is, you know, maybe it's not perfect, but nobody's come up with anything else that's better. And I really feel that we strongly need something. We, we need some kind of guidance in our sport. We need better across the board medication rules. And if USADA can help us with that, look, I'm worried about it. I think we all have right to be worried about it, but I think anyone that sees our sport in this day and age knows that we need to do things better. And I, and I can only hope that USADA is gonna help. I, 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 I agree. And you know, with, with, with the whip rule, what, what I could never understand about it, and I think um, California was the first to kind of limit the amount of times a rider can hit a horse. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't the stewards and don't the stewards always have the power to call in any rider that they feel is misusing, abusing, or excessively using the crop or, 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 or the whip on a horse? I believe they do. And I, I think it's a mistake that it hasn't been done more. I mean, I've watched horses get hit way more times than they should do between the quarter pole and the wire, and sometimes from the gate to the wire. And I think, you know, if I have a problem watching it as somebody that understands the sport, I think for the average person who just enjoys watching races, I think it's, it's very offensive to see horses get hit way more than they should. And I think this is another reason we've ended up in this situation, perhaps because the stewards haven't policed it like they should. Exactly. You know, in defense of the stewards, they probably have so many other things that they're dealing with. You know, it's, it's just one more thing that it's just hard for them to, to oversee. So, look, I, I just think we have to do better. And I think, you know, to have some kind of a national policy would have avoided getting in this messy situation that we're in now. Yeah, no, see, I, I, I agree. I probably don't give as much leeway to the stewards as you do because my, 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 my thought is it's part of their job, you know, and if they're doing their job properly, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we need four stewards instead of three. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, you know, and I, I certainly don't profess to know all the answers, but I think that they've always had the authority and, 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 and the power to police that and prevent it from becoming an issue. And like you said, offensive to fans or, or people that are being introduced to the sport that may not know as much about it as someone like yourself um, or the people that frequent the sport regularly. And if they're noticing things, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously becoming an issue. But this is another thing that I think, you know, in our sport probably needs to be controlled better. Perhaps it's, I don't know this for a fact, but perhaps it's too easy to become a steward. Perhaps it should be a more difficult profession. You know, perhaps we need better leadership in the stewards. And again, it's from state to state, it's going to vary. But, you know, I don't want to be second guessing the people that run our sport. I want to have confidence in the testing system. I want to have confidence in the stewards. And, and I think this is all something that hopefully the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act is going to provide. And I don't know, I, believe me, I don't have all the answers, but I know we need to do better with it. Across are the you, board. Uh, man, and, 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 and I agree. Do you lack confidence right now in the testing in certain states? And I won't ask you which ones, but just Look, I, had, I had an issue in, in Kentucky myself. Um, several years ago, and I felt that I was tripped up by the system. I felt that I followed the guidelines very closely, and I was tripped up by the system. And I, I want to have confidence in knowing that we're doing the right thing. Um, you know, it's, it's all very well to live in a fantasy world and think horses don't have to be medicated. Horses, just like humans, need to be medicated. Um, but we need to understand the guidelines. I, if, if every time you had an NFL game on the weekend, Every time you move to a different state, you had different guidelines or different rules to follow, um, different thresholds. How confusing would that be? And that's pretty much what we're dealing with right now. Every time we ship out of Fair Hill to another state. Right. And, 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 and I, I imagine it's even more difficult for someone like yourself when you're training at a place like Fair Hill, as opposed to being stabled at a racetrack where you're running 90% of your starters at a certain jurisdiction. And obviously you get to know those rules like the back of your hand. When you're shipping all over the place, it's gotta be an, a, a nightmare, no? I will tell you in the last five or six years, whereby I think we've tried to do things better, things have become so much more complicated. It is really hard to keep up with the rules. Um, one of the things that I thought, 
w w was a possible solution, okay, to, to, to the things going on was, I, I, I thought it would be a good idea, and I don't know if, the, if, if, if HISA is going to do this or not, but I thought it would be a good idea for any drug that's used on a racehorse come from, as opposed to independent vets that work back, that work on the backside, everything that's administered to a racehorse comes from a centralized pharmacy, pharmacy facility on the racetrack grounds that's monitored, supervised, that we know exactly what horses are getting. Um, it's all recorded, it all comes from a specific lab. Uh, you know, I wrote an article a, a, a couple of months ago, Graham, about the Jason service and Jorge Navarro indictments and that stuff, I don't even know the name, SG whatever 1000 that they were allegedly using, okay? I don't even know where it is. And I went online and searched it. And I found half a dozen places where I could buy it now. And I thought that, that that's just absurd, you know? Um, I, I, I was just amazed that it was so easy for me to just sit at my computer and find places that I could actually buy the stuff that these guys were supposedly indicted for using and probably sneak it onto a backside and give it to a, give, 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 give it to a horse or find some vet that could ob obviously do it. So I thought that everything, um, a, a possible solution, that everything should come from a centralized pharmacy where we know exactly what, what, what these horses are getting. Any, any thoughts on that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea, but it's complicated. You know, I think the Stronach Group came up with this idea not that long ago, and they, they um, put out the idea of having perhaps a, a central pharmacy in, in Florida, for example. The, the problem that I see with that these days, and I'm not against it, I think it would be a great idea, but a facility like Fair Hill, I don't know how you're going to control it. You know, it's very easy to control um the vets and, and the medications on the back stretch but you know these days there are more and more training centers right and it's very hard to to police the training centers you know we we don't come under uh, the maryland jockey club here at fair hill we're a private entity um somehow there has to be a way where perhaps horses are going to have to ship onto the track you know a certain amount of time before they run um perhaps for the triple crown races all the horses should be kept in the same facility, you know, so that, um, you know, for example, a horse like Bob's horse couldn't, couldn't get in a situation where if, if it had the wrong medication, you know, you'd avoid that happening if, if the horses were moved around in the same facility for those um, five weeks, perhaps. And I'm, I'm just putting that out there. I thought that the holding barn in New York, which we had five, six years ago, probably longer than that, 10 years ago, uh, you had to be in the holding barn at least six hours before the race. I thought that was a great idea. You know, everybody had to show up with your horse. You had your, your tack box was inspected. Right. Um, your own vet, personal vet, wasn't allowed to come in. And I, and I thought that was a great policy. And I, I think some horsemen didn't like it because some of the horses got upset. And, you know, the expense for the NYRA was probably a little burdensome. But, you know, I think these are things we have to do better in order to have integrity in our sport. I, I agree. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that's just, you know, hurting us more than a lot. Well, I guess now, now a lot of the people that run the racetracks, I think are starting to realize um, how bad the perception issue in our game is, is, is hurting our game and, and, and the survival of it. And I'm, you know, I'm of the opinion that we're at a crossroads where the survival of our game long-term is, 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 is questionable if we don't, um, take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and 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 you, you know straighten out a, a, a lot of, a lot of the things that are going on on within the game. Uh, to more positive notes, okay. Um, mean Mary. Before we talk about Mean Mary, is she named Mean Mary because she's a mean mean horse, or or is she named after some somebody that was mean? I think it was a little tongue-in-cheek by Mr. Campbell, whose secretary is called Mary, and she's, okay. certainly, she's certainly not me. So, you know, actually, this filly was very difficult as a two-year-old, and we really had a hard time with her. Um, we ended up, I think it was my wife and, and my assistant came up with the idea of turning her out all day with main sequence, who could be quite mean himself. Um, they struck up a great relationship. You know, we pretty much trained her out of the paddock for, for most of her two-year-old and early three-year-old year. 
Um, but she she was very tricky. She's a lot easier now, but she still has her moments. Right. Now, I, you, you know, when I saw her in the New York, um, the first thing that hit my mind was, you, you know, I looked at her and I said, you know, she's coming back a little bit quick for Graham. Um, I, 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 I thought she was coming back a, 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 a little bit quick. So what, am I reading into that correctly? Is she just doing that good or is this just a great spot? Because pace wise, she absolutely seems to be have a, have a distinct advantage over the rest of the field. Look, I thought she had a pretty easy go of it the other day at Pimlico. Um, you never quite know how much a race is going to take out of a horse, but I, I, I felt that that was more of a stepping stone to get her to this race. Um, I don't think Louis had to hit her the other day. You know, they left her alone early, going a mile 16. Um, so I just felt she handled it well. I, you know, I have long-term goals for the summer. I'd love to get her to the Beverly D. Obviously, I'd love to have her at the Breeders' Cup at the end of the year. So... You know, certainly I won't be in a hurry to run it back after this one, but I felt that this was something that was within her scope to, to run back this week. Right. And, it, and, and, it, and you know, to your credit, it did come up, you know, pace-wise, like we discussed earlier, where it just seems to be a, a, a lack of, of that early pace. Now that I said that, everybody will want to go, 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 go for the lead this weekend. But uh, she definitely... <laughs> I don't feel like she's a horse that has to have the lead. I mean, she's just a galloping filly. You know, she she will gallop all day. And I, I think the mile and a quarter is much more her game than, than what she did the other day. But the other day, you know, she kind of got things her own way. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you had to say the biggest issue in racing today um, that needs change, that needs to be addressed first and foremost to get get the ship right, be it, be it, uh, you, you know, wagering, medication, um, uniformity. What, what, what's, what's Graham Motion's opinion on, on, on number one on the agenda to get things right, if you were the man in charge? Well, definitely uniformity. I mean, you said it. That, that's what we need desperately in the sport is uniformity. Well, let's hope, let, let, let's hope we're on, 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 on our way to that. You know, Graham, I don't want to take any more of your time. I can chat with you all day long. Um, the last question I will leave you with is this. Um, Kentucky Derby, Dubai World Cup, Breeders' Cup, you can take your choice. Which one that night gave you that just unparalleled feeling of, of, Yes, you know, of, 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 of those three, which was yeah. the one. It, it's so hard to separate them. I mean, obviously, my first Breeders' Cup with Better Talk now, that was not something I expected. He was 27 to 1 that day. I'd never been to the Breeders' Cup before. Um, winning the Kentucky Derby was like an out-of-body experience. It wasn't something I'd set out to do. Um, you know, that was an extraordinary feeling to be there with my family. But winning the World Cup, you know, that was... That was something that a year, like, like I said earlier in this interview, almost two years planning to get us to the World Cup that night and to pull that off with the horse. You know, I kind of held my breath the whole week because I felt like the horse was going to explode. Um, to get him there that night at the very best of his form was, was an extraordinary feeling. And it was an awful lot of money. I, yeah, no, for sure. And, I, you know, I remember back when that was happening, because um, like I said, I was a huge Animal Kingdom fan. I remember there was a video that had come out and it was you and Joel sitting down either in your house or his house or somewhere watching replays and like, you know, talking about the race and plotting the race. And really, it just struck me back then. I'm like, you know, these guys are, are, are they're, they're, they're going ready. I mean, not just the horse, but they're, they're, they're going ready. I, I don't ever remember seeing a trainer and a rider sitting down in front of the TV, watching replays, talking about all the different nuances and, and, and prepping for a race that way. It was almost like watching an NFL team prepare for a game, watching, you know, watching video on, on the defense of the other team or vice versa. And I don't ever remember seeing that before. And I think that was, that was great. And uh, uh, what, 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 what was that like? That was, oh, I don't know if you remember, but Joel had actually gotten beat on Animal yes. Kingdom's previous start on the grass where Johnny had to ride for sure. I um, remember that, and I remember Barry got mad at him. <laughs> so we came to the decision that 
all needed to sit down and go over his races. Because we had a two race commitment from Joel that he was going to ride in, in that race at Gulfstream and he was going to ride in Dubai. So, um, you know, we all got together at Barry's house and, and went over videos. I must say, I remember that night, I was so nervous. Uh. I, I'm not good at giving jockey instructions anyway. And I didn't know Joel that well at the time. Um, and I just so badly wanted to make sure I didn't tell him the wrong thing. But all through the night, there was very little, very few horses were making up ground on the track, on the synthetic that night. And I, I finally, you know, just went and spoke, sat down and talked to Joel when he had a break that night. I was like, we just can't leave him too much to do. And uh, he rode a great race. He did. And that, 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 that was a great job um, a couple of years late, but congratulations um, on a great career. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, a, a, a pleasure speaking with you, Graham. I uh, wish you the best this weekend with me, Mary, and, 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 and beyond as well. Thanks, John. It's going to be a fun weekend. Absolutely. Gino Russo has taken the lead. And it's a vintage performance by Vino Russo. Nobody does it better. <laughs>